All right. Kia ora no tātou. Um, o tēnei me te whānau versus family. If we think about whānau and family, it's not just because one is interpreted in English. Family and or whānau, especially whānau, is quite, can be, the meaning of whānau is quite complex because it often includes the physical, the spiritual and emotional um, well-being, or that, those particular dimensions that um, it's based on whakapapa. And whakapapa for whānau, when we look at that, that we, we actually go right back to the be beginning, what we call the oroko hanga o te ao, or back to the creation of the world in terms of tangata whenua, especially the, the people of the land, right? So Fano for me is very specific. It looks at the creation, not with Adam and Eve, uh, but also the, but the creation around um, um, Atua Māori, the Māori gods, around Papa Chuanuku, Mother Earth, and uh, Ranginui, Sky Father. So we're talking about that particular creation in terms of whakapapa for Fano. And so we go right back there and we start to journey back through looking at how Fano for Indigenous people, for Tangata Whenua of New Zealand, the people of New Zealand, um, viewed their whakapapa. So their connection back to the land, back to the maunga, back to their waka, um, back to their marae, their hapu, and their iwi is really significant in what whānau means, all right, as opposed to family, which is just looking at a nucleus whānau and maybe going back just three generations, mother, father, so on and so forth. However, for Māori, it's much more than that. And often when they introduce themselves, they're referring to what they call, what we call, our pipeha. And that is acknowledging those things that were created before mankind. And of course, our maunga was our first, our waka, that brought us to, to old Dauroa in the beginning. It's actually quite a complex, um, but, but it's the way people have lived, or what how um, Māori people have lived and survived to today. Um, again, when we look at family, um, it's not so significant. I think there's been such a change over the years when it comes to whānau. Our whānau often become disconnected. And when I say that, I'm referring to having to live away from their whānau unit or living away from their whānau hapu in iwi because of um, the, the reliance on um, um, funds or having to find work in order to survive. Traditionally, when we look at whānau, they were supported. They supported each other. And so it was a collective kind of um, journey or well-being within that whole community. But as time changed, the arrival of um, Tawiwi or foreigners, as they would have been considered back then, uh, still is today, of course, nothing's changed much. Um, things began to change changed drastically for Pano, and we know that at the end of the day out of 60 million acres of land or 60 sorry 60,000 600,000 something like that of land confiscated our people have very little to uh, survive on so many have moved away and gone off to live in uh, in cities where there's a chance of be becoming employed in order to survive. Um, and that, however, has broken down that um, collectivism or that unity, or kutahitam, as we see it. And so, therefore, the survival of many of our people, as we know the, the statistics today, is quite overwhelming when we um, look at 
what's happened to our people now. Many homelessness, unemployed, statistics are, are just on and on. The health, the education, um, the social, um, social well-being of Fano are just not as strong as it used to be back in our traditional times. So, um, many of our people, when we look at it. <clears throat> Whānau relationships also, and that's another part of it, we have to be mindful of their whānau um, relationship also includes the whāngai or foster child. They are a big part of their whānau as well. They're never seen as different. Um, they're part of their family. So um, and when we look again at our whāngai children or foster children, and, and also those people, those that have passed on, um, the roles and responsibilities um, by the people, by the hapu, was really important in terms of ensuring that it was, that everyone within that system was taken care of, or within that, that group or hapu. Um, and so when you often hear the phrase that it takes a tribe, to raise a child, that's absolutely correct. It was the people within that, that whole collective that took care of their, their child. And so that ensured that their child's well-being, health and safety was paramount. And so over the time, the arrival of um, Tawiwi and the missionaries, there were lots of comments about the fact that they never saw children being abused. So we know now times have, things have changed. And that has to, and, and in order to ensure the safety of our tamariki, our tamariki mukupuna, we have to make some really strong commitment to making changes but we can't do it on our own. We have a system, I suppose, that should be supporting that, but that hasn't happened. And so within, that, within the system that we have today, from that time up until now, when our language was um, um, stopped within the school system, and everything else that went on throughout the schools, within the systems itself, whether that be within the health system, whether that be within education um, and um, justice system and the police system, so on and so forth, much of what's happened to our, our young people, and our not so young people, has been as an impact of those particular systems that have never actually been responsive or positive um, response to our people, especially our young people as well. Um, lots of changes, I believe, needs to start um, with the partnership between ourselves as Tangata Whenua and our Tawiwi um, people that are here. There has to be a better way of working. Take, for example, the uh, coronavirus. That's been a real... That saw many people coming forward and ensuring that everyone around them was being taken care of or looked after. Um, and the government did come forward. I have to add that as well. In terms of ensuring that there were... Um, funds available for food and stuff like that. But I can see that until there are more changes made, um, it's only a temporary start. Um, I, I think also when we when we go back and we have a look at our the historical um, advancement of Banu. When we look at how a period of time in Māori 
had a subsistence lifestyle and contributed, as I said earlier, labour to the welfare of the whānau. The historical whānau was also referred to as the traditional Māori whānau. You've got many people, people like um, the name jo Joan um, um, Medgar, Medgar, who described the whānau of the late 18th and early 19th century as the classic whānau. As a, she, as a, Joan was an anthropologist, so her work was really quite significant in terms of um, finding out how our people survived and lived throughout that time. And so she discovered quite a bit of stuff um, about how, how Māori were, or how Fano existed. Um, and I suppose when you look at the family way of thinking, it's like very individualistic. It's about me, my and I, not them, they and us. So, and, and I will say that Fano is about them, they and us. We, we do not exist. Fano cannot exist on their own. So we incorporate and bring together all of those really important things about who we are in order to survive. However, there's also the mighty dollar sign or the mighty dollar. Today's age, time and age, um, we're so dependent or we've become dependent on the mighty dollar. And until there are other ways of doing things um, in order to survive, you're paying for rent, power and so forth. There is no land for our whānau to go back to. For many of our whānau, a lot of our, the land was uh, confiscated or stolen taken away, you name it. And so many of our people are living on the streets, um, under the bridges, you name it, out in the park, in the corner of a park, trying to trying to keep themselves undercover so that they don't get picked up and moved on. And unfortunately, that happens often. The rental costs, of all property, of um, renting property, it's quite significantly high. And at the end of the day, people can't afford it. So they have to move into their cars and live out on the roads and in the streets and at the beach and at the river. And you just name it, there are so many of that. You can drive, drive along the coastline and we know that our many of our families are just living in tiny little shacks, sheds that are, that are dilapidated, um, carports, and so on and so forth. And it's just quite a sad case to see, especially when you're seeing young children as well. Um, so hopefully, we're always so hopeful. We're always quite hopeful. And I think that's the complexity I speak about when it comes to as whānau. And so when you look at families and they're just coping with this, they're coping with just their own little family, um, it's often because they can't help in order to survive themselves. They're just working on that, my family, me, my and I, and that's most important. And sadly enough, um, it, 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 that's the com complexity of it all, um, unfortunately. What Pano means as well. So, all right, um, let's carry on. All right. I think I, I also want to have a look at um, the different meanings around what whānau means, or what that, each, that term means. So we look at the word whānau, um, it has some a, a number of meanings. And whānau also refers to the birthing, the, the birthing of a child. In the sentence, ka whānau mai he whakaro, if you're using that, um, it's when you hear the words uh, whānau mai he whakaro, 
in my my thoughts it, it's like very simple you ha the idea has has come to um, come to mind and so whatever that is or an idea which has come has been has been born that's that's what this um whānau mai he whakaaro. In this particular kaupapa whānau versus family, that was a, a thought or an idea that came to mind in order to be able to present something to to the, to the listeners in order for them to kind of see the significant differences between whānau and family. Often I have people who say, so what's the difference? Only one is English and one is Māori. And that's true. It is, but it's a Māori whakaro and a, a English whakaro, right? And so we can't kind of uh, mix that up too much. I suppose when I say that also, um, we look at how the separation and division of whānau have, have become ripened. And that is, and as I said earlier on, it re it's dependent on a cash flow. And so traditionally, whānau never relied on cash. They relied on each other. That, that importance of unity and kotahitanga was really significant in the well-being and the survival of whānau. Um, today now, that has become um, dominant. Cash, the cash economy is much more dominant, which then creates uh, the division. Um, and so therefore our home or our household um, the ad adults are out working while the children are dominating away at school. Um, I think another um, category of fano that we we kind of look at sometimes and we overlook um, while we talk about fano as papa based, and we also have fano which is kopapa based fano, and that particular ideas around how we place particular stress on other characteristic characteristics features of the whakapapa based whānau, which is whānau values and a ways of working derived from this particular thinking of whakapapa based whānau. Um, I suppose if you have a look again Whānau is used for close, um, the metaphor or the tikanga of whānau is also about how we engage with our close friends. And close friends and associates, associates are inclusive within that whānau group. So they become, and I suppose there are many examples out there when we think about, um, take for example, Te Whānau Waipareira and how they work from a very urban um, domain or area, um, it's quite important that while they work there and they refer to themselves as not only as the kaimahi that works alongside the whānau, but that... Um, they work with all groups of people, no matter what. And so what's important for them is that whānau uh, whakaaro or that whānau um, well-being or whānau order or whatever that, however that is perceived within their kaupapa. But then you also got other groups out there, kaupapa Māori services, that work from a very whānau-based uh, collective um, and there are many that can be named. The first thing, first group I think of right now is Chūtama Wahine from New Plymouth, a group of Māori service that has, has worked consistently from that perspective for many, many years, almost 30, 40, over 40 years, almost 40 years. Um, and so they're very, even today, still very, very proactive in ensuring no well-being. Uh, we've got other groups such as um, Tuwahine, based in Auckland, again, a whānau um, kaupapa that works collectively with whānau and families. 
You know, it's, it's just one is not separate from the other. If you need the help, then they're available. Kitarabi Daughter Trust is also another a group that has worked quietly and silently throughout from the beginning of the early 80s and have worked on quietly just doing them work. And I must say also, um, never really, um, again, the, when you look at the dollar or the dependence on the dollar, with or without fun, uh, funding, get that up, it all, it just continue to work on as volunteers, voluntary doing the work. Um, many of them now have kind of hit um, the goal card stage and still doing the work with little or no funding. But that's, again, the dollar has not been a significant part of that, um, that service um, um, survival. Um, again, I suppose when we think about um, Fano and the individual, <laughs> I think sometimes that's the problem. While we begin, Fano does include individuals. It is part of uh, the importance that we work alongside individual people. Fano. The relationship between the, the individual and the whānau is, is subtle and complex. Recognising also that the individual have rights of their own, but they exist because of whānau, so very aware of that. And they have responsibilities to the whānau. Um, and those responsibilities too is ensuring um, the young people are taken care of, that they're available for their health and well-being as well. I'm referring to the individual being available there for the health and well-being of the mariki, of their children, and the extended family, no matter who that may be. And outside your own immediate family, is others who can become really quite um, dependent. And so how do you navigate and, and, and a system in times of need? That's really important to consider. Um, it's easy to turn the back and walk away. Um, however, when you turn back and recognise it, they're important to no matter who they are. As I said earlier, the COVID lockdown actually brought a lot of that out, out of people, recognising that, hey, it's not just about us, not about just about me, my and I. It's actually about them and us too, in order for us to all survive in a state of well-being. Um, I just want to go back a little bit, back to the beginning when I referred to the beginning of creation and how significant it is to be able to recognize that while it takes a tribe to raise, while it takes a, a whānau to raise a child, traditionally the whole collective took care of, of them. It wasn't just one. Person, but also the importance of understanding that when we look at what pepeha actually means, it's all part of our, it's, it's whakapapa. And in terms of recognising and understanding the importance of our maunga, of our waka, people say, but that was created by man, so how could it have been? And my response to that is very simple. We're referring not necessarily to the building of the waka. I am referring to where the where did those that wood come from? Where did that rako come from? It came from the wild tapunuya tane. It came from tane mahuta, the forest. They gathered it. They had to gather it. So it was already there before 
people arrived before people became life or life, they found life. Prior to that, the Ngahere was already formed through the creation. And within that Ngahere, we had certain gods that took care of each of those domains, such as Tangaro with the Moana, Hine Moana as well. And then you got Tane Mahuta in regards to the forest, and so on and so forth. All of those Achua, the 70 of those Achua, had a specific role to perform. The, um, while we had Dane Mahuta, who was also the, probably the most important or significant one out of the group that was obvious, um, his role was to take care of the forest. And within the forest were the birds or the animals. And so those two are our chuakana from a whānau concept, right? Remembering that those birds were also... Um, existed for the survival of the people. But when that happened, there were certain times when they protected those birds and ensured the survival of those birds. So it wasn't about going out and slaughtering them left, right and centre. There was a specific and very conscious way in which that, that particular, it was just about survival of, of me, uh, human of um, dira tangata, mankind, but it was also survival of those birds, recognising that they were also ngā chuakana, or they were, chuakana are the elders, those that are created before you and I. Right? And that's the difference. Um, and our people knew that, whānau knew that back then, in order to survive, you had to make sure those specific species of animals, all species of animals, were protected too. You just didn't go and mow them all down just, just, just so that you could. All right. So recognizing the the significance of that, but also our maunga. In order to, when we first arrived, our people arrived here in Aotearoa. The first thing they looked for was the and saw was the Mona. And so from there, they guided them inland in order for them to to settle. And from there, the, um, the hapu, the, the people came together, the whānau came together, and from there, they, the, the hapu was developed. And as the, the different hapus developed, so became an iwi. Um, really, really important in order to understand that. Hence the reason why it's quite important to understand the difference between whānau and family. Um, much of our, you know, much of our thinking sometimes has become very individualistic. And, and so it's, again, nothing much happens there. It becomes more of just me, my and I and my family. And often when I have people talk to me or say that, oh, my family's important. Yeah, that's true. Absolutely. Every family. Was, um, um, as family say, well, I'm, I'm you know, they, they refer to the fact that uh, my family's really important and they're the most important thing to me. But I'm also suggesting that, well, not suggesting, I'm also saying that at the same time, as as we reach out to those outside our family, as we perceive as outside our family, we must remember that um, everyone, we can't survive without each other. And so that's the problem. As a family, sometimes they struggle. They struggle because it's only they, they believe they're just working with themselves, um, doing their own thing. They don't have to worry about anybody else, so they don't need to share the resources. They don't need to care about anybody else. But I think the, the COVID um, um, has kind of opened eyes for many people. And hey, we can all come together and we can all hold hands together and we all survive together in one way or another um, without this individualistic 
view about me, my and I. Um, I know I've always used that term and everything that I do, when, even when I'm, I'm doing my work out in the community. It isn't just about me, my and I. Otherwise, I wouldn't be out there doing the work for start. For nothing, I must add. I do it because it's important to bring the whole, all of us together as one. And just to mahi tahi, kia kotahi ai, mahi tahi tātou katoa, work together as one. However, there's always that struggle with um, trying to find a link with other service providers. And, and again, I'm going back to the, the um, around funding or the mighty dollar, which actually causes the division. So um, it's not just within whānau and families. It's also within service providers as well. It becomes more of a competition about the mighty dollar. And so if you're not, if you're not funded or you're doing the work voluntary, people don't really care. It's fine, sweet ass. They're not a, not a, um, we, we don't need to compete with them. Um, when I think about the Māori wardens who have been out there for many, many, many years doing the work voluntarily, our people that continue to do that work, that's what I call whānau. They come together out on the streets and people think, well, we don't see them, and that's right. You don't often see them because they're out there early, late nights, early morning. We see you. We absolutely see you coming out of some of those um, hotel places, places where they um, where alcohol is being um, sold. So yeah, we do. We even pick some of you up and take you home. So I'm talking here about my role as a warden. As a warden, we work with Fano. That's the difference. But it's also with a Fano for Karo but we work with the individuals as well. That is so important to understand that. And so that individual or family or, or member, those are not significant in our role. We don't separate or, or say or, or go on. It's, it's interesting also, just a point that I need to make about this is that often when we see people walking the streets, when they're on their own, we know we'll pull up and, and ask them if they need a lift home. And usually they think that because we're Māori warden, if it's um, non-Māori, and they think that they um, that we don't work with them, heck yeah, we do work with them. And so they, they, they come forward. Our Māori whānau, when they see us, they're happy to step out and pull us up so they can get a lift home. Um, but we pick everybody up, no matter who they are, also, our overseas tourist people, that come in and they walk in the roads. We pick them up and if we can put them down, if we had a, have a base, we, we allow them to rest there, refresh and, and move on the next day. So, and that again is around safety for all people, no matter who they are. For us, they're whānau. They're our whānau. It's not just me, my, and them and they. It, it's all about ensuring everyone's safety and survival, no matter what. Okay, um, that's us. Awesome. Okay. Um, so thank you very much for your kōrero today, Fire. It's been very, it's been a big learning experience and thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be here. Um, but also as well, there are some really interesting uh, things that you've talked about today. And so um, I'd just like to ask you a couple of questions, please, so that um, our audience can also have some more learning from you. Okay. Um, so in the beginning, you talked about how some missionaries and early settlers commented that abuse of tamariki was not observed. Um, among tangata whenua. Can you explain a little bit more about why this was, please? Okay. Again, it goes back to our 
the principles that we, within our language and the principles that we believe that, that guided us. And those principles around manakitanga, kaitiakitanga, um, whanaungatanga. When you look at, um, at tamariki, straight away, you break that kupu down, straight away within that, that name itself, within that kupu, it gives you the clearest, the tahawairu, or the connection of what that actually means. Tama ariki, or the, the sons of the arikis, of the great ariki we know are those of great higher standing. If you look at some of our whakatauki, it refers to e kākano irua mai irangi atea. So our people were very mindful about the way in which those those particular uh, whakatauki proverbs um, were were um, put out there. That was to remind us that know where you come from. You you are not just a human. You're not just something that just came out of the air and settled in the the ohudumu way of your kui or your mum or your, your mother. No, the seed came from that of the highest realm, from Langiatia. And so our people knew that. That whakaro within their head was really mindful about the fact that each child was born from within a spiritual realm being from that of an ariki. Right? And to understand that, you would not abuse it. So our tamariki were part and parcel of that whānau collective, and they were learning alongside the elders. And the elders did this. They, you know, we didn't have schools. If you have a look at the school system itself, we have one. If you look at a triangle, you have a, a triangle. At the top is one person teaching a group of people. If you look within a Māori worldview, the triangle's tipped over and it is a group of people that's teaching the individual which was that, that particular child or those children, okay? So each of those particular um, the survival and well-being of those tamariki in terms of their education came from the group or the whānau hapu iwi, right? It wasn't an individual teacher that taught them. They were taught by many. And that's why our people also knew the importance of that particular child or children. Each one was selected based on the way in which the elders considered their learning should happen. Right? I don't know if that makes sense or if that's of any that, help, but um, that does that's make the importance sense. of it. That does so make important. sense, and I think thinking about a triangle as well is really helpful. Yeah. So thank you, Fire. And mm. another thing that you've also talked about is you've talked about you know a lot today about me, my, and I, which is kind oh. of like you know that individualistic thing, and that's it's something right. that we've also linked back to yeah. a nuclear family unit. Um, yes. Could you please maybe just explain? you know, a little bit more about nuclear family unit. Nuclear family, that's right. Absolutely. And I think I use the term, the me, my, and I stuff. It's just it's me, my family, and I. It's just us. That's the most important from that nucleus thinking. That's that unfortunate part. And that's why I'm saying it's we have to start actually thinking about and reaching out and trying to draw everybody in. Hey, even if we're just holding hands over the fence or we're just communicating with our whānau over the fence or walking along the footpath and, and just sure, ensuring they're okay and are they safe and how can we help. Uh, there's been a positive um, um, side of this COVID um, lockdown. It has got people to start thinking about not just me, my and I, but them, they and us. See what I mean? It's the significant importance of the. It's opening people's minds out. It's opening them out to, you know, we go out and um, distribute. I mean, we, we go out to distribute 
um, food packs, care packs to our people out there that we know need it the most. And, um, and that in itself has been quite a very, quite a moving um, opportunity to hear and see what our people are actually going through at, this, at that time. And even at this time, who knows it's still happening. And the struggles that they are in, and it goes that well, When you have a think about it, you look at the mighty dollar and the kotahitanga, where everybody, it is a collective effort to ensure that everybody's taken care of that, that, that food. I wouldn't, I, while I say everyone, I would hope that everybody is getting that support. But I think there's always that um, that concern that many of our people don't actually um, get that help. And I'm aware of that as I work within my community that that's not quite happening the way we would hope. But hey, it's a start. We're all starting to, to come together, hopefully, to think from that very whānau whakaro, right? Just that, 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 that feeling or that whānau um, kotahi that we've all come together to, to think about how we can mahitahi together. How do we do that together as a community, as a wider community, so on and so forth? Um, I think, I'm, I'm not sure if I've answered the question, but yeah. And that's an important um, question. Um, it's important to understand that when the collective was put together, um, it was our Tauiwi caucus they called on our Māori groups out in the in the community to come together to work out a way. So it, it was obvious that our Tauiwi caucus or our um, our Pākehā groups were wanting to work side by side with with Māori and hence the reason back from that time I think around about 2005 um, that that particular um, idea came to fruition and we've got to thank our, um, our Catherine um, for initiating that thought at the time I don't know there may have been other um, discussions at that time to call on to call on our um, Māori service providers out there, our Kaupapa Māori service providers, such as Tuahine is one of them, one of those groups. And they came together and they talked about a partnership, working together within the Tiriti Waitangi partnership. And that's how this is start. So I'm saying that people are coming together, whether they be uh, individuals, um, a non-Māori or Māori group, have recognised that it, it's quite significant in order to make changes, especially around the field of sexual violence. Right? Sometimes their kōpapa is hushed up and pushed under the carpet. It's a little bit, some people find it a little bit uh, challenging in order to be able to so they pull it, put it under um, domestic violence, and we know that sexual violence not just within the domestic realm. It happens right, right across the board, even out in public. And so it's not just a domestic environment that we, where this particular ngangara or um, problem begins. Right? Um, you can be a out. Um, on your own and, and, and being molested by a stranger. So we can't exclude that and assume that that doesn't happen, because it does. But most significantly, it's within families and whānau, right? And so the groups came together, Māori and Pākehā, and decided to set up, and hence the beginning of Tōnanis. Um, so that's been a really important um, move in advance and it's still happening. So that's our partnership, our treaty, Waitangi partnership with our Tauiwi caucus. 
I, I, I hope that answers. Suffice the whole overall, just trying to um, pull the whole whole cocoa put together. Just being mindful too that, um, like I've talked about, um, the collective and and the individual. But there's nothing to say that we we can't all come together. We are doing that at a national level under Tornanes. That's a significant move for us. And I have to say, wow, look at it. That's almost what, almost 15 years, and it's a long time. And we're still very close to our our um, Tauiri caucus, and we help and guide and support each other. And that's kotahitanga. That is so important in terms of whānau versus family. Those concepts, all the different, there are so many other different concepts that, that I could talk about, but the, that particular whānau, um, whānau family um, concept is an important um, part to start with. So, um, any other questions on open ears? Kia ora mai. Um, that's all the questions I think that we have for today, Fire, but thank you very much for your time. It is greatly appreciated and you have done an absolutely fabulous job today and I think thank you. definitely we have to do more with you in the future because you have so much that you can teach and um, it's you. very valuable teachings as well. So thank you. Can, um, a well-known pakatoki, I must say. Of course. It goes, e hara taku tō, i te tō taki tahi. Engari, e tō taki shini. So what that really means is my strength does not come from me alone, but it's the strength of many. Rapai. So remembering, I don't do this mahi alone. It is because of the strength of many that helps us to exist and survive. Nō reira, kia ora nō tātou. Mairi ora.